او اجين ماي دير فريند دكتور عصام عثمان هي ويل توك اباوت ذا جوفرننس Mr. Chairman, I, I deserve an extra couple of minutes for that. Don't you agree? <laughs> Thank you very much. Right, uh, let's try again. Safe surgery. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is clinical governance. Um, does anybody know the Arab translation for clinical governance? al hakuma that's governance. al hakuma is siriria, it's clinical governance, which is, which is a great term. But that's a term that was coined uh, by the NHS, and it basically means it's the uh, systematic approach for health organizations through which they must always look to maintain and improve the quality of care they're providing to their patients. There are six pillars to clinical governance. The first is clinical audit. There's clinical effectiveness, which is doing the right thing to the right patient at the right time every time. Research and development, openness and transparency, both within the organization and with the patients managing risk and having risk management systems in place, and education and training. Now, I believe that there are five drivers or enablers for patient safety and uh, high quality clinical care. If the organization understands this, um, then I think they're well placed to deliver good clinical care. The first is to reduce unwarranted clinical variation. If I come to see Muhammad Umar, or Samir with a 5.8 centimeter aortic aneurysm, there should be a pretty standard process that I go through. Um, the organization needs to understand the types of errors that it makes. We are humans, humans are fallible. Human factors is now a big part of any system. And the highly reliable industries, such as aviation and nuclear, cater for human fallibility. So understand the type of mistakes. Modern vascular surgery is delivered through teams. It is not the days of a standalone vascular surgeon are no longer something we can defend. And where teams don't work well, how do we improve them and use tools such as crew resource management, which we've taken from the aviation industry. Remember that 95% of errors within a healthcare system are due to the system and not to humans. And therefore we must encourage a just and blameless culture. That is very difficult, particularly in this part of the world. I will show you a case today that will shock you, and the first thing you will do is you will blame the person who was involved, but maybe we should be blaming the system. And transparency. So how do we go about reducing variation? Well, start off by looking at your high priority clinical areas. Don't start with something that's not common. So we have a problem with permacaths in our hospital. We put in a lot of permacaths, um, and we get a lot of iatrogenic injuries. So we start by auditing that. And then we get together and say, what is the clinical evidence base around best medical practice? We all agree it in the department together. Uh, and not just the vascular surgeons, the interventional radiologists, the nephrologists, the intensivists. Once we've agreed the clinical evidence base, we build our guidelines and our clinical pathways. And then we say, this is how it should be done. And then we monitor compliance and try to understand why people vary from it. Sometimes it's because they're not following the guidelines, sometimes because the guidelines are not practical or realistic. Types of errors. This is the really interesting part of it. The commonest error is what I call diagnostic anchoring, which is a form of confirmation bias. It's when you look at something, your brain says, this is a mycotic aneurysm. You have other pieces of information that suggest it may not be, but your brain suppresses them. And this diagnostic anchoring takes you down a certain path. And that's where the MDT is valuable because somebody who's not so anchored might come in and say, have you considered a ruptured PAU here, etc." Then there are knowledge-based errors, which is what the juniors make. They make mistakes because they don't have the knowledge. Systems built around them to make sure that they don't make decisions when they're not sure. Then there are rule-based errors, when there are certain rules, but they're being misapplied. The common one I see in, in my hospital is if you have an elevated creatinine, then you will get or may get contrast induced nephropathy, so don't do a CT scan. So I've seen people in the emergency department who are really sick and dying, and the CT will help you treat them being denied a CT scan with contrast 
because um, the rule says don't do that. And then there are skill-based errors, which are the ones that you guys will make and we all make. And these are your very skilled individuals, but due to fatigue, a lapse in judgment, or what we call limbic capture. Limbic capture is you left the house, you've had a fight with the wife, she's irritated the hell out of you, you go into the operating room and your mind is on something else. And something you've done a hundred times, you do badly. Teamwork, um, if you're interested in the five qualities of highly functional teams, there's a great book by Lencioni and he's, he's described the pyramid of, of what makes teams work. The base of the pyramid is trust. As a leader, how do you engender trust in your team? And the answer is by not being afraid to show your vulnerability to the team. If they see your vulnerability, then they don't feel uncomfortable sharing their vulnerability. And once you've built trust, then we can have disagreement and conflict without fearing that somebody is going to be attacking us. And you've got conflict is healthy. Challenge is healthy for the patients. If I don't agree with your treatment plan, I should be able to say it without fearing that you're going to, even though I'm a junior member of the team. Then you get commitment. And once you've got commitment and people are accountable, and once they're accountable, they are results driven. So teams, good teams will demonstrate these five qualities. And when you're building a team, think about that. If they're not working well, then you can look at crew resource management, which is something we've taken from the aviation industry in helping you deal with dysfunctional teams. This is the difficult part, just and blameless culture. People will make mistakes. And if we blame them, they're going to hide their mistakes. And if they hide their mistakes, we cannot learn what the weaknesses are in the system. They must be able to come forward and report mistakes without blame. That is a difficult step to take. Humans are fallible. They will make mistakes. Encourage openness and reporting and try to become a learning organization. What's a learning organization is one that is continually trying to learn from its mistakes by not hiding them, by investigating them, etc. Transparency is key and openness. So if you are really as good as you say you are, publish your results on your website. Publish your falls. Publish your pressure ulcers. Publish your SSIs. Be open about it and try to be the best at getting better. Everybody wants to be the best, but try to be the best at getting better. So this is the case I wanted to show you, and then these are the two minutes I have. This is a case that was treated here. This man went to... One uh, minute, that's all. Yes, thanks. This man went to, uh, to have... Uh, this is the killer punch. Have uh, an aortic aneurysm repaired. This is what was done for him. Now, if you are working, six months later, he came back with pain, and uh, we did a CT, and this is what we found. Now, if you're working in a hospital with good clinical governance, how would you approach that? The first thing is your risk management system would pick it up. You do a serious clinical incident investigation. You try to understand what happens. Then you would do a clinical audit of this person's practice. And once you've done that, you decide whether this person needs retraining or not. These things go on every day in this part of the world. We don't have the systems yet to, um, to support them. I, it would be remiss of me to give this talk on clinical governance without mentioning my dear friend Claire, who passed away three days ago. Claire was one of the leading surgeons in the United Kingdom, and she did more to improve clinical governance than any other surgeon I know in the UK for the last 20 years. May she rest in peace. Thank you very much.